Hey and welcome to Tea with Tess, a weekly gathering of women across the world. I'm Tess Yana, co-senior pastor of Link Church and the founder of the Link Sisterhood and Tea with Tess. This moment was created with the heart to encourage and equip you in your personal faith journey. As we explore God's Word, I want to encourage you to lean in, subscribe and keep showing up as we go somewhere beautiful together. This is a place where you'll hear from me and some of my very special friends that are near to my heart. For more information and resource, visit tessianek.com or connect with me on Instagram at tessianek. So when Tess told me about this series last week, it, um, it sent me to a place I wasn't sure I wanted to go, and that is back to 2020. Uh, back to the memory of um, the brokenness I encountered there. I'm just going to be so honest here, so I hope you are okay with that and just come with me on a journey. Um, I, I encountered brokenness in lockdown and I encountered a lot of things that I dealt with before. A lot of stuff that Tess has walked through with me and um, yeah, just a great leader in that. But um, I was also had a pit in my stomach as I remembered my husband picking me up off the bathroom floor after a panic attack. After I'd been journeying on and um, pretending everything's okay and running from myself, I found myself in my home with nowhere else to go and I ran into myself and it was a very humbling reality. It was a very painful reality, but I wouldn't take back a moment of it because in a dark night, I met a God who welcomed my wrestling and I met a God who made me sweat to sweat and skin to skin and he's a good, good God who wants to meet with you this morning. And so if my journey could teach you anything, super profound, I don't know if you're ready. I might just wrap it up after this. If my journey could teach you anything, it's that Jesus is enough. I know, I know. <laughs> Jesus is enough. And um, as I've been seeking God for this moment, I keep coming back to back to a scripture and a story. And it, when I first, um, when first, God first laid this on my heart, it didn't make sense because I was, it didn't line up with my story. But He took me on a personal journey and. And showed me a lot and I think it's stuck with me and it's stuck around because it's something he wants to do today in you and it's something he has for all of us and um, so I will I am just going to share my story but I'm also going to share the scripture because um, it is our story scripture is our story and it's where the real power and transformation lies so that is where we are going so stick with me I promise we are going somewhere and the scripture is Luke 24 and it's the road to a mess and um, it speaks of a literal journey that two disciples went on, but it's also a, a journey that I went on personally, and it's a, a journey I believe he has for all of us. And so here we go, I'm gonna read for you and then we're gonna just jump into it and God's gonna do something special. Um, Luke 24, 13 to 18. So it says, now that same day, this is the day that Christ rose, the day that Christ rose and he brought a new world with him. So that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked alongside them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk about? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened? That's Luke 24. You see, even though they'd been told about a witness of angels in an empty tomb, they still set themselves on the road back home. They still put themselves on the road away from promise, away from hope, and they couldn't even see that promise and hope walked alongside them. It said, it said that they were kept from noticing him. And I feel like this is for someone specific here today. It is for all of us, but it's also for you that's hurting. You that's put yourself on the road back home. Maybe you've lost a lot in this season and maybe you're not sure if you can trust the truth. You're not sure if you can trust, um, maybe the world's louder than, than the scripture you get to read all the, all the time you get to spend here. And it just feels like it's drowning, drowning it out. Um, but I want to tell you that God wants to meet with you this morning and he wants to do something significant in you In verse 15 it says Jesus himself drew near and walked with them and this is the promise Jesus himself 
and he wants to breathe on the bones you've been trying to bury, the things you think are too far gone. God wants to breathe on them again. He came to reveal himself to people who had lost their way, who had lost their clarity and lost their direction. And I believe that that same thing is going to happen this morning as you've come desperate for hope, as you've come lost or maybe just um, with a blurred vision of what the world's looking like and the noise of the world that's drowning out the voice of God. I want to say that he, he Jesus himself, will come and walk alongside you and you will hear him and your eyes will be open to see him standing. Your heart will be open to see him and hear him standing here all along saying, look again, trust again, turn again. Um, and then as they go on this journey, we're going to carry on and I promise we're going somewhere. It's just be patient. <laughs> um, ironically, so they, they carry on on this road and they go on to tell Jesus about his own crucifixion. And I, I like to think Jesus does a, a, a little spirit under his breath because um, he tells them about his crucifixion and, and their disappointed hope. See, they'd come and they thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel, uh, to redeem their circumstance. But he came to redeem their souls. He came for something greater. And I think so much of my journey was learning that um, he doesn't always appear in the way that I want him to. But it's always in a way that's better than I can even imagine. And bigger than I can even imagine. And he's always doing so much more. And so from verse 27 it goes on to say that he opens up the scriptures to them. And starts to reveal himself from the prophets. From Moses and the prophets. He starts to show his... Um, how he appears in scripture and he brings him back to truth he brings him back to truth and like if you can think of that bible study like to be there the word made flesh the self-revelation of god bringing them back to truth to christ and him crucified and you know what it's the same way he does today in the pages of his word with authority and affection he still meets us in this word this word still holds power for you now I love how Dylan Tess always say, what if the word still worked? What if the word still worked? What if he still met us in the pages of his word with authority and affection? And so they go on and they walk with him. And after they've walked with him for some time, it says that they approached the village to which they were going. But Jesus continued, continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with him. And even after he has taken much of our sadness away, even after he's shown us much about himself and ourselves, he can still remain the stranger that we met on the road. He can still remain the remarkable one that crossed our paths and talked with us for a while. It takes an invitation. And as the night came, the disciples clung to him. That word in the Hebrew and the Greek, it says they clung to him, they desperately clung to truth. It's one thing to walk with him in the light of day, but when the night season comes, are we willing to cling to truth? Are we willing to invite him in behind the walls of our most intimate life, into the back rooms of our homes? You know, those rooms you'd prefer, <laughs> prefer to keep safely locked from yourself even. You know, those thoughts you think when everyone's asleep and you're, <laughs> you're lying there, those thoughts. Will you invite him in there? The most intimate, scary places of yourself, will you invite him there? And this was something that I had to choose in lockdown. And it's something Tess always says is to be willing to do the work. To be willing to do the work. And, and to let Jesus do the work in me. Will we invite him in? Will we cling to truth? That's something that I had to choose to wrestle and to feel. I always thought, you know, that it, it was brave to um, overcome your feelings. And uh, rah, rah, you know, <laughs> that's how it is. But um I think lockdown taught me that um, the bravest thing we can do is feel, and Jesus meets us there anyway. And in Isaiah 45, 3, God says, I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. There are treasures hidden in the night season for those who choose to find them. There's a secret place where we can find Jesus and we can find goodness in the dark. We can find him if we're not content to sleep through the night. Because that was a choice I had. I could sleep through it all. I could turn to Netflix. I could turn to all the comforts that I could. But I chose to meet with, Je to meet with Jesus. And I wrestled and it hurt like you can't imagine. But I'm here today. And I can say that he is good and he meets with me. 
And the disciples, you know, the, the rich is stored in secret places. The secret place is the intimate place. And here the disciples could have kept on walking and they could have said their goodbyes at that point. But they chose to invite him in to the intimate place of the table to eat with him. And this changes everything for them. And it changes everything for us. Communion with Jesus. And as they sat at the table with him, he assumes the position of the host, which is not normal for a guest. He assumed the position of host and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And this is the amazing part. It says, at this very moment, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It's in the breaking of bread that they see the fullness of Jesus because in it they see the breaking of his body. They see the cross and they see him risen in front of him. They see, the, they see the fullness of Jesus. And this isn't the first time we read this in the Bible. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, these are the very words that show up in the temptation of Eve and the fall of humanity. So it says here, you know, well, the serpent took the words of God, like the serpent or the enemy always takes the word of God and twists it. It's never his own original eyes. He's not very original. Um, and, he's, and he promises them open eyes if they eat the forbidden fruit. So they ate and they did see, but here's the difference. In Genesis 3, it says, Then their eyes were opened and they recognized they were naked. In Luke 24, it says, Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. In Eden, their eyes were opened to shame, but in Emmaus, their eyes were opened to Jesus. And this is what happens when we sit down in communion with him. When we open this word and we invite him in, eyes that were once clouded with the murkiness of sin and shame become opened with the clarity of the revelation of the Son, of Jesus. He takes off shame and he points us to the Son and he shows us that it's finished. They see the finished work. They see their shame gone. And when we see Jesus, we see God's redemption plan. We see, we see Eden ruined. We see Eden ruined and restored and we see our future. Revelation flows from communion. We see him. We spend time with him. We see him. It's a promise. He loves to reveal himself to you. I always used to think that I had to search and find in scripture. And I think I approached it much with striving until I learned that God wants to be found more than we want to find him. And if I just gave him half the chance, he would meet me wherever I am. And you know the greatest mystery of it all? It says, just as they recognized him, he disappeared from their sight. When they enter into the most intimate communion with him, he disappears. When he becomes most present, he becomes the absent one. In many ways, he had been the one who had gone ahead. Jesus as their leader, as their rabbi. He had been the one who went ahead, the one up there who showed them the way. And now, as they take, as they take the broken bread, they realize, and that realization is a deep spiritual awareness, that the one out there is in here. That he is the one that lives and speaks and breathes in them. And this changes everything for him. With just a simple revelation. And um, so I think my family's on here. So I'm going to be nice and say that I grew up in an amazing home. Which I did. Not perfect, but amazing. And it was a Christian home. And I'm so grateful for that. I got brought up in the ways of the Lord and I like to think that I only departed for a little while and came back. <laughs> but um, I got saved when I was quite young. But for a very long time, Jesus remained the one out there. The one ahead, you know, the, the extra, the other. Until I was about 16 or 17. And um, coming to Link Church <laughs> and in the very deep, dark end of it, an eating disorder and depression, a deep depression that I ran from and denied and fought and hid. Until one day, I met Jesus for myself and he became the one in here. And standing in a moment of worship in the church, I met Jesus for myself and I saw him and I felt him and I knew him. And I knew because I knew that he was alive and in me. And I knew because I knew that that was enough, enough for my depression, it was the turning point of my depression, and it was the end of an eating disorder. He pulled me out from the mud and mire, and he set my feet on a rock. He saw with one, one glimpse of the true Jesus, he took what was dead in me and he brought it to life, and he set my heart to burning. And as the disciples see Jesus, 
And it says that after they had seen him and he disappeared, the disciples say to each other, we're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened scripture. And when I encountered him, it wasn't a feeling. A burning heart is not a feeling. It's a revelation of Jesus. And it's a revelation that will sustain us through every feeling. In Matthew 5, 8, it says, What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will be open to see more of God. The Greek is they will continuously see God. Revelation isn't a one-time thing. It's an ongoing, ever-deepening, ever-widening thing. We're never done with Jesus, and he's never done with us. And thank you, Lord, for that. In Psalm 16, 11, it says, For you bring me a continual revelation of resurrection life, the path to bliss that brings me face to face with you. And there's some things that the enemy desperately wants to keep our, our view limited on, our perspective distorted about. And he will bring distraction and confusion and everything of the world to keep us from catching even just a glimpse of the true reality of the whole picture. Because he knows that we do the greatest damage to darkness when we're walking in the light of truth. This truth. This whole truth. This whole truth. Because everything that threatens his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, everything that threatens the kingdom of darkness flows from a revelation of Jesus, from when we see him, because it's truth that awakens our hearts and leads us home. From communion comes revelation, from revelation comes repentance. And I know I've said the R word, repentance, okay? But I believe that it's for us and it's for today. And I believe that it's something the enemy has desperately gone after in the church because its actuality makes him nauseous. Just stick with me, I promise. I hope you'll see it too. You know, the enemy longs for us to keep denouncing it as Old Testament legalism. He longs for us to keep shuffling past it awkwardly in the new. In the Screw Tape Letters, which is my favorite book, and Tess knows this, we share um, a lot of uh, books and love for books <laughs> but the screw tape letters is by c.s lewis and it's basically the perspective of hell and it's um it sounds strange but it's not but it's uh, two demons exchanging letters and they say it's funny how mortals always picture us pu as putting things into their minds in reality our best work is done by keeping things out our best work is done by keeping things out he desperately wants you to step away from this book but just keep showing up just keep showing up and so I want, to, I want to show you what I've seen in repentance because it's something I wrestled with for so long. Um, when I first got saved and I started reading this Bible, I saw it everywhere. And I didn't understand because not a lot of people spoke about it. And when I did speak about it, there was a lot of confusion and blurriness. But I knew and I knew because I knew that I hadn't seen the whole picture. So I stayed and I wrestled. And I'm grateful I did. And could I just suggest, just, just a throwaway suggestion, that if we're encountered, if we, when we encounter and we're confronted by uncomfortable scriptures, could we stay and wrestle? Could we stay and wrestle? Would, would there maybe be hidden treasures there too? Would there maybe be a reason God's given us this whole word, every word? You know, Jesus says that every word attests to him. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul said, I determined to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. And Tess has helped me so much with the revelation of grace and the continuous revelation of grace. But if the good news you're reading isn't good news, if it isn't good, if you aren't seeing Christ and the finished work of the cross, then you haven't seen the whole picture. And it's worth staying to wrestle because the revelation is beautiful. It's always beautiful and it's always changing and it's always transforming. And to stay in the fridge magnet verses, Gotta love them. To stay in the fridge magnet verses would be to miss out on so much of who God is and what he has for you. So just went a further. Um, okay, so repentance, back to repentance. Repent was the first word in John the Baptist's gospel. It was the first word Jesus preached when it said Jesus began preaching. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was um, the disciples preaching instructions. It was the first word in the, um, the Christian sermon after Pentecost. It was the first word in Paul's preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But here's the beautiful part. When they preached repentance, it was never repent because you're a terrible sinner. It was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
It was never ever meant to be a response to seeing our sin or a revelation of our sin. It was always a response to seeing the sun. It's a response to the, to the news that the king and his kingdom were coming. We're here in one sense. His kingdom's already here in one sense. True revelation leads to true repentance. And this is the cool part. You know, it isn't about uh, moralism, about doing better. I spent a lot of time. Um, I'm an Enneagram 3 if you're on the Enneagram, so I like to think that I can do things, do many things for God, and He's taught me how to be many things and be. And um, it isn't about moralism, and it isn't about doing better, it isn't about feeling sorrow over our sin even. It's about turning to the sun. In Hebrew, the word repentance is shuk, and it's translated to return home. Its very essence is to return to covenant relationship with God, a home for every ache you feel. After the, after the disciples had seen Jesus, it was then that they, it says that they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They turned from a mess, from everything that they had always known, from everything that they had always done, and they returned to Jerusalem, the place of worship. It's not something we do to come to God, it's the very act of coming, it's returning home. And it always leads to grace. In 2 Kings 25, it tells the story of um, uh, the tribe of Judah going into exile and being captured by the Babylonian Empire and, to, and imprisoned. All of them were impri imprisoned until Babylon got a new king. And, and just think of, think of us until we got a new king. And this is what changed. And so their king Jehoiakim, the one imprisoned, it says, So Jehoiakim put aside his prison clothes and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. And this is repentance. It's setting aside our prison clothes and returning to the king's table. Hebrews 12 says, Laying aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles and returning to the king's table, the place of clarity and communion, of revelation and revival of a burning heart. It is for freedom that we have been set free. A new king reigns. A new king reigns. So I don't know what God wants to do with that, but it just it felt strongly on my heart. And uh, I'm going to begin to close up. I know we have been here for a while, but I'm going to begin to close uh, with a story. And it's a girl very close to my heart. But she went off after school and went to university. And um, also from a great home, but met the wrong people and went astray, found herself in the wrong places and the wrong times, filling an empty space in herself. And she did and before she knew it, she was at this university away from home, deep in a drug in a drug addiction. And when she couldn't go anymore, when she had sold everything she had, she returned home. Bruised, ashamed, broken. At the end of herself she returned home. And as she told her parents what she had done, she began to tell her story and say she's sorry and she couldn't even pick herself up off the floor as she cried and she sobbed and she told them. And in this very moment, her father gets up and he kneels down and he holds her face and he lifts her head and he looks her in the eye and he says, my girl, this one's on me. This one's on me. And I can't help but think of Jesus as he got on his knees and washed the disciples' feet, as he got close to their mess and their brokenness, and then went to the cross the very next day to say, this one's on me. And you know what? I fall short every single day, without fail. Every single day I fall short and I bump into brokenness. And every single day God bends down. He looks at me in the eyes and he says, my girl, this one's on me. And that day that I saw him for myself standing in Link Church, that day that I saw him, I saw his cross. And on it, I saw him hanging there. I saw him hanging there with my shame, my pain, my story. And I knew because I knew that that would be enough for me. I knew that he was enough for my depression. And I knew that I wanted to live like it. And I wish I could say that I saw the light and every darkness left. But the truth is the ache still feels bold and underlined sometimes. Lockdown was dark. I take medication every day of my life and I wrestle with it. 
but it doesn't hold me anymore. That is the difference. It doesn't hold me anymore. What once held me now leads me to the cross of Christ. And at the cross of Christ, I see again that I once was dead and now I am alive. And the same wind that resurrected me then can do it again, moment by moment, as I turn to him, as I fix my eyes on eternity. I can know wholeness because I can know Jesus. And I can say that I am healed and I am whole and I am loved. Not because of what box might be ticked on a medical chart, because that hasn't changed. But I can say I am these things because I have the Spirit of God living inside of me. He once was out there and he now is in here. I once was dead and now I am alive. And I have the Spirit of God living inside of me. A spirit of joy and not depression. A spirit of peace and not anxiety. And where there's life, there's shadow. And that's the reality of the side of eternity. That it's going to be here. And as long as we're, we are the side of eternity, you know, I, could, I believe God can heal me. I do. But that's not what I'm after. That's not what I'm after. And I can spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder and running from darkness. Or I can pursue the light. I can accept that it's a part of who I am and it's a part of the world we're living in right now. And I can pursue the light. And until the day when we walk with him and we dwell with him forever, until that beautiful revelation day where it speaks of every pain being wiped away, every tear being wiped away, death and destruction being no more. Until that day, I can walk with him in the middle on the way and I can know him. And so if my journey could teach you anything, it's that Jesus is enough for you. That you can stare brokenness in the face and you can still know wholeness. That you can limp to the cross with a crutch and it would beat out your finest run in any other direction. This much I know. And you can live like you're whole and healed and enough and full. Even if everything inside of you and around you takes time to catch up to the eternal reality. Because we don't live in this world, we live in an eternal reality. You can live awake and alive more than you can even imagine. I wish I could tell a past Amber that. You can live awake and alive more than you can even imagine. And the greatest treasure can be had and known here and now. That his name is Jesus. And he is enough for you. Enough for your next step for your broken dreams, for your hurting heart, for your hopeless situation. Everything changed for me, everything changed when I encountered the living God and I turned from my mess road and I followed him and I chose him. And so that's, the, that's what I wanna leave you with today is the invitation, the ache that is an invitation. And it's possible to be a good person and it's possible to call yourself what you want and, um, and still sit on the throne of your own heart. It's possible to lead your own way. And repentance, in its essence, is turning from ourselves, turning from trying to save ourselves. You know, I met Jesus, I tried, I tried every way. I tried to go off medication, I've tried every, all the things, all the ways. But when I met Jesus, he healed my heart, and I know he can do the same for you. Whatever, wherever you find yourself, whatever you may be in, I'm gonna pray for us now. But I'd love you to respond because the kingdom of God is here and it's, and it's coming along with his freedom, his power, his love, his wholeness, his healing and you can know it too wherever you find yourself and whatever your enough is for you, whatever you're not enough is for you, Jesus is enough and every person that Jesus called, he called personally and publicly and so I want to call you today personally and publicly whatever that looks like for you today, if you want to turn to him again if you want to return or maybe turn for the first time, I want to invite you to do that and make a public declaration of it, whether that's a comment and we can pray for you, whether that's a shifted position, an outstretched hand, whatever that is for you. When we do, when we do something in the natural, it shifts in the supernatural. And I'm going to pray for us. As you respond, I'm going to pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you are enough. God, we thank you that you meet us right where we are. God, that we can know and treasure the greatest prize that is your presence in the here and now. And God, we say, will you meet us in our brokenness? Would you meet us where we are? God, would you give us greater revelation of who you are, of your Father heart, of your Savior Son, of the Spirit that lives inside of us, Jesus? Would you help us follow the path, follow the path back to your heart, Jesus, back to home, back to our true home? 
I thank you, Jesus, that you are the home of every ache we feel, and we can come boldly and freely because of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And so we say yes again. We choose it again, Jesus. We choose you again. Maybe for the first time we choose you, Jesus, and we say we follow you. We say we love you. We say we give you the room and we turn to you, God. We repent and we believe and we turn to you and we say, have your way in us, Jesus. Thank you that you are enough. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with me and for sticking around and hearing my story. It's been so encouraging to see some comments um, come through. And if you still want to respond, you can do that. And we'd love to go back and pray for you in the comments. But thank you so much. And thank you to Tess. Um, yeah, we honor you and we love you. And we thank you for the space. We thank you for who you are and what you do and what you carry. Because it's profound and it's significant and it's supernatural. And we're cheering you on. And so this next week, we are having a special guest again. If I know, I think, I hope. Hope I don't give away anything, but we are, and we would love to see you. So thank you for being with us, and we love you. See you soon.